This evening, I apologize for us getting started a little bit late. Um, we are calling this meeting to order, and we have a quorum. I appreciate everyone's attendance, including everyone in the audience. Uh, before we get started and do the Pledge of Allegiance, I would like to take a moment of privilege to recognize that tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of the Covenant shooting and tragedy. Um, and as we all are aware that that was incredibly shocking, not only to the nation, but particularly to our own local communities, as many of us have our own concerns about gun violence, since it's the number one killer of children, but also because we knew many of those families. So if you will please join me before we get started in a brief moment of silence in honoring the, the beautiful lives of Catherine, Mike, Cynthia, Evelyn, William, and Hallie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, tomorrow there is a linking of arms and asking for change uh, in remembrance with a lot of those families. I will be in attendance and I encourage you to be as well. Um, and I appreciate the amount of work that's done by many of the people here in the room, whether they're my colleagues or those viewing, um, whether they're a part of a organization like Moms Demand, Rise and Shine, Voices for a Better Tennessee, or all the Covenant Moms. Um, I really appreciate your consistent work and being present and um, being bearing witness to the work that has to be done for us to get those changes made for the safety of our children. So I appreciate that. That brings us to our Pledge of Allegiance, and for that, I ask our senior board member to please lead us in that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. That brings us to another uh, new event that you would experience today on our board agenda, and that is a board member swearing in. We are so excited to have my newest colleague joining us, Ms. T.K. Fain. And so we are excited to have you here, and for that, we invite you and Judge, to or Chancellor, excuse me, <laughs> to, excuse me, Chancellor, to uh, come up to what we're calling our horseshoe area so that we can do our swearing in. Uh, we look so forward to hearing it and, of course, having you on our board. Support the Constitution of this state, and the United States, and the United States, and that I will perform with fidelity, and I will perform with fidelity the duties of the office, the duties of the office to which I have been elected, to which I have been elected, and to which I am about to assume, and to which I am about to assume. Welcome to our first Metropolitan Management Center. We are all your mothers now. <laughs> Thank 
We are so excited to have uh, Member Fain join us here on the school board. She proudly represents District 5, which was recently, or previously, I should say, represented by Ms. Christian Bugs, who also served as chair for several years. So she has been incredibly active in the community. She took on an impressive role of asking to step in before the election took place this summer. So we really appreciate your willingness to serve, not only your own community, but MMPS as a whole. We look forward to working with her. And yeah, yeah your son is now one of us. And so we will, <laughs> we will be like, come stand with us. So we are really excited. And of course, this is District 5. I do ask just briefly that you give her some grace as she is just joining us. She does not have an email address yet. That starts, they start doing that because she's now legitimate. Uh, they now start working on that. And we'll have one in the next couple of days. But we look forward to it. And of course, we have some onboarding we'll do. And we're excited. That gets us to the adoption of our agenda. So for the adoption of the agenda, I need to take off one point. Let's start at the right place. Under governance, it's 1D 1.404. So I need to remove that from the agenda. So may I have a motion to adopt the agenda with that Amendment. Motion to adopt with uh, amendment. Thank you. All right. Any discussion? All right. Seeing none, all those in approval of the agenda, please raise your hand. Oh, you can raise your hand now. <laughs> the unanimous. She was so <laughs> member Fang was so generous to be at all the committee meetings, but could not vote yet. So we appreciate that. Thank you. It's unanimous. All right, that gets us to one of our most exciting times of our board meetings, which is the awards and recognitions. And to do that, I will turn it over to our director of schools, Dr. Adrian Battle. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Erod, and good evening, board members. I'm excited to recognize an outstanding principal first to kick off our awards and recognitions this evening and many outstanding students tonight. So let's get started. First up is Principal Jennifer Reinecker from Donaldson Middle School, who has, who has been named the Tennessee Music Education Association's 2024 Outstanding Middle School Administrator of the Year. Principal Reinecker was nominated for this award by Donaldson Middle School's band director, Laura Shepard, who wrote in her nomination letter, despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, Ms. Reinecker has prioritized the importance of music education, ensuring that DMS band program continues to thrive. While the road to recovery may be ongoing, her unwavering support and belief in the benefits of music education have propelled the program forward. Her commitment to the DMS band program in particular is exemplary. With her unwavering attendance at performances and regular expressions of pride, serving as a testament to her belief in the transformative power of music education for children. Principal Reinecker will be honored at the Tennessee Music Education Association's Awards Banquet and Gala on April 11th here in Nashville. Congratulations, Principal Reinecker, and thank you for everything you do to support Donaldson Middle School, music students, and teachers. Again, let's give her a round of applause as we take a picture. It's good to see you again, too. All right, next we have 14 MNPS high school seniors who have been named finalists for the National Merit Scholarship, which recognizes them for ranking in the top 1% of all seniors across the United States based on their performance on the PSAT in their junior year. 
This is a high honor that reflects the skill, talent, perseverance, and dedication of each of these students and suggests, as we would expect anyway, that they will continue to excel after they leave us when they graduate in a couple of months. Scholars, we are so proud of each of you. As I call your names one by one, please come gather around the podium up front so everyone in this audience can admire you and smile at you, and then we'll get a group photo. And if I can ask everyone to just be patient with us um, as they come up, that will we'll be able to hear every name um, as they're being called. So the 2024 National Merit Scholarship finalists are from Hume Falk Academic Magnet High School, Isaac Asink. Isaac, if you're here, come on up. Let's give him a round of applause. All right, next up is Jacob Contos. Nicholas Ostrowski. Jack Reynolds. Tyler Reynolds. And if you're listening, listening closely, yes, Tyler and Jack are brothers. So congratulations to them. <laughs> um, John Ree. Layla Setlow. Ray Scott. And Jerry Zhang. All right, and from Martin Luther King Jr. Academic High School, we have Nathaniel Halevi, Tigran Polborn. and Justice Chef. From Nashville School of the Arts, Deidre Kelly. And from John Overton High School, we have Vincent Guo. All right, y'all, let's give it up one more time. And congratulations to our National Merit Scholarship finals. All right, now I hope Vincent from John Overton don't go too far. 
We're about to see him again with nine of his classmates. So um, the next 10 students have won Cambridge Awards for their excellent performance on the 2023 Cambridge International Education Exam Series. Cambridge is an advanced academic curriculum that John Overton High School has used for many years. It offers deep understanding of subject matter along with critical thinking and independent study skills. Over 3,500 Cambridge Awards were distributed to U.S. students for their academic success in the U.S. and across the world. Students, this is a wonderful achievement, and we are so proud of all of you. As I call your names, please gather at the podium, and then we'll take a picture together up here. Um, let's get started. All right, the Cambridge Award winners in the scholar category are Gracie Bixler. Next up is Aya Dean. Daily Dowdit. Vincent Guo. Princess Nuozo. Hazel Perez Garcia. And Aaron Smith Deals. And in the merit category, we have Erilyn Davis. Joseph Garati, and Sophie Spivey. All right, congratulations to our Cambridge Award winners representing John Overton High School. Dr. Garner, I see you back there too. Congratulations. Lots of um, student celebrations today, um, just exemplifying their academic excellence. Um, we also have a new award to celebrate tonight. At the start of this school year, we began a partnership with the National Education Equity Lab, also known as Ed Equity Lab. They want to see talent matched by opportunity. So they work with school districts to give high school students opportunities to take classes from top universities, which meant that Antioch High School, one of the schools where we piloted the program, was able to offer an introduction to computer science course from Stanford University in the fall semester. 
This is a great way to increase early post-secondary opportunities for our students as they prepare for college career and life. And our students are taking full advantage of the opportunities. Recently, we learned that two Antioch High School students have been selected for induction into the National Education Equity Lab Honor Society for their great work. We are so proud to have Antioch and MPS represented in the Honor Society by these two excellent students, so I'd like to ask them to come up for recognition and a photo as I call their names. The first student we would like to recognize is Kevin Garrido. If you're here, come on up. Is Kevin here? And Jason Molitor, you come on up and join them. All right, before we take this picture, I want to say congratulations to Kevin, to Jason, and to everyone else we've recognized tonight. We're so proud of you representing Antioch High School, um, both locally and across the country. Congratulations. <laughs> Look at this. What does it say? Where excellence meets opportunity. That's the motto in Antioch High School. I'm here right here. One, two. I'm a proud bear mom. Right here. Well done. That's a great work. All right, Chair, before I turn it back off to you again, I want to extend congratulations um, to our principal and all of our students across the district who are recognized um, this evening. Um, thank you just for your excellence, um, for your representing Metro National Public Schools and your respective schools so extremely well. Um, again, congratulations. And Chair Elrod, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, it's always an exciting time. That brings us to a piece to our uh, board meeting that I'm really excited about, and that's going to be our student board member reports. We have two student board members that will be giving us a presentation along with their colleagues. Um, we will hear from them along with some of their um, not colleagues, but their peers. peers. Thank you for the word uh, for their, their peers about their scope. Uh, conference presentations and all of their interactions there, along with just some other information about them being student board members. I'm excited that we're able to include them inside of our um, agenda and have them speak to us on the board floor in a more formal fashion. So without that, without further ado, I turn it over to our student board members so they can present to us. Hi. Before we go any further, Member Mays, do you have anything that you would like to add as their mentor and liaison? I am super proud of these young people. Uh, just unfortunately, one of our team members, uh, Ms. Aubrey Patton, couldn't join us tonight because of her schedule, but she did submit her uh, report, and I am so, so proud of these young people. They did such an excellent job at the SCOPE conference, so thank you again for participating. Hi guys. So, um, I'm Elena, if you didn't know. And um, I'm Christine. I'm Kavion. Speak into the mic. Yeah. I'm Kavion. Kavion, tell us what school you're from, Don. I'm a sophomore at McGavick High School. There you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, about two weeks ago, we attended uh, the Student School Board Association Student Congress on Public uh, on Policy and Education. Um, so the three of us, plus Aubrey from a senior from John Overton High School, um, we all attended this conference. So we just want to talk to you guys a little bit about what we learned, what we did, and what we took away from it. Right. So before I discuss what I did for the debate, I want to talk about what we what we 
ha what happened at the beginning of the day. So we all split up into groups, and in each of those groups, we did our own little mock board. We elected a superintendent, and we chose board members, and we discussed we, we, you know, different policies. And that, and that was also a really cool experience, just meeting new people around, well, it's just not our district, but people from all around Tennessee, who had to drive hours and hours. That was a really cool experience, because everyone there was super smart, super super love, super caring, super friendly, and it was overall a really great experience. So what my group was going to do was we were going to be con speakers for four day school weeks. So we were arguing against it. I unfortunately wasn't chosen to speak for my group, but either way I did assist in helping them make up points and helping them put together a speech. I think that's kind of what most of ours, most of our groups did. Where's next? Oh. So essentially, my group, we first nominated board members. Uh, I was voted, well, I was voted as our group superintendent, where I, uh, you know, talked to the community, uh, the, the teachers, all that stuff. Well, teachers. <laughs> um, listen to the, we uh, came up with a plan. It's a that's misspelled. Came up with the plan to like, uh, y'all see that student internship requirement. We uh, came up with points and. And we came with, uh, we made our debate on it. That's essentially what we did, yeah. So in essence, uh, everyone started off the conference um, with their groups and they had this mock school board meeting. Um, so we were divided into grade levels. So the sophomores uh, discussed um, the internships. Our juniors discussed um, so four day weeks, four day school weeks. Um, and so the seniors, we discussed uh, student cell phone use. Um, and so the idea was that, um, I'll just read it. In recent years, cell phones have become more and more of a distraction to students. Some of the community advocate for a complete ban on cell phone use during the school day. Um, and so our group was to argue against that. And so ultimately our argument was that the role of schools is to prepare students for real world success. So restricting cell phones would limit students' ability to develop self-control, responsibility, and ultimately doesn't mirror everyday society because there aren't a ban on cell phones. Um, so I was lucky I was chosen to represent my group um, um, in the conference debate. I'm up there. Um, and we actually won by a very large margin, so that was really, really fun. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Aubrey also was a senior, so she also worked on this, uh, on the uh, cell phones, but she was arguing for it. Um, and so she just gave us a little uh, note to read about her experience. So she said, attending the SCOPE conference provided me with an invaluable chance to advocate for myself while representing Metro. Collaborating with like-minded individuals in my group's debate on, on phone policies was both inspiring and rewarding. However, the highlight of the conference for me was facilitating a mock school board meeting and forging connections with peers from diverse school districts across Tennessee. So ultimately, that's what we did. It was a very great networking experience. And like Christine noted, this was from people from all around Tennessee who thought like Nashville was just so huge and we were just, y'all aren't country enough and y'all aren't this. And it was just, but it was just really fun because it was just a lot of different perspectives. And even me, I can't imagine being from some of those small towns. And some people only had once, didn't you you had a group where it was one st school in the entire district or in the entire county? Like, you know, so it was just really interesting to see all of those different um, groups and all those different perspectives. And it was just overall a really fun experience. So thank you so much, Ms. Mays, for bringing us along and staying with us. And yeah. It was an incredible experience with these young people. Uh, I had a group, I was a group leader at, at the SCOPE conference, and I had a group of 16 young people, various counties. The largest district that I had was about 2,000 students. So. Listening to the perspectives of a large school district like mine was uh, was really interesting and eye opening to them. So it was really, and Kevion didn't give it enough, uh, didn't give us himself enough credit. Uh, they had to. There was a mock school board um, that had to be selected, and a superintendent search that was conducted within the mock school board. And Kevion was elected as or selected as the superintendent for his group. So that's a big deal. And it was definitely a really 
fan, it was a fun experience for them, and we're excited uh, to uh, participate again in uh, next year. So I think uh, Kevion is uh, definitely on board to participate again. So uh, thank you, thank you all for uh, what you do and uh, representing Metro Nashville Public Schools so well. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate our students giving their time to not only being student board members, but also stepping up outside of being a student board member and even going so far as to being the superintendent. Uh, look at that. Um, so I really appreciate you giving your time. I think your perspectives are important, not just to students, but as was mentioned, of a large urban school system. Um, so I really appreciate that. We always uh, covet hearing what you guys think about whatever we're discussing, but I'm sure that those were appreciated there as well. Um, so everyone knows our student board members are up for election. We're going to have, it's an internal process, but the applications are, are up and available. They're on our board website. So you can click on those and apply if you are an incoming junior for next year. So we will be losing our senior board member as she is going away to college. And then and, they will uh, move so into Chair senior Elrod. and so forth. One thing, Chair Errol Rod, and I'm going to put her on the spot here. So one of the things that we talked about uh, at the SCOPE conference, we've asked Elena several times to give us um, her decision on her yeah. her school. And she promised that tonight she would reveal her her uh, selection. So oh. we're waiting. Tick tock, tick tock. I want to know. I did not promise I was publicly going to announce it, but it's OK. <laughs> I will be attending Hampton University. <laughs> Love it. We are so proud of our student board members. Um, if this is your first time experiencing our student board members, just like our the children of our other board members, we take them under our wing and mother them as well. So we celebrate you and we're so proud of you and of course you as well, Christine. And so we're excited to have adding to our board. Thank you for joining us and helping us at Scope and of course at Overton as well. Um, even though you're not on the board, it was so important that we heard your voice and I appreciate it so much. I Thank also, you. I'll say, I also have to add, and I told Dr. Battle this, but I'm rooming with an MMPS gym, so we're also doing good things, and I literally met her through the program, so that's really yeah. exciting. So, yeah, I just had to shout that out. Neat. Thank you. We will have another, in May, we will have another uh, student board member presentation for another 10 minutes or so to go over their goals and responsibilities as we're continuing to grow this program and more formalize it and make sure that we are supporting these students and that they are also doing what we both hold our ends of the bargain, that they know what we're expecting of us and so that we can be good mentors to them as well. So I look forward to having that in May. That gets us to... Um, our director's report. But before we do that, if I may take a point of personal privilege, um, we, before this meeting, had two committee meetings. One was budget and one was governance. At the time, we stated that that was going to be reconvening immediately after this. It instead will be reconvening at 4 p.m. on April 9th, which is our next meeting. And before we move on from that subject, I want to make sure that there's nothing else that needs to be added from the governance chair, Emily Masters. Thank you for that. I just, I wanted to add that, um, I just sort of wanted to reiterate something we've talked about on the board floor before, which is that it is only through bringing forward policies that we can have robust discussions about policies. We, do, we don't create policies together behind closed doors because of sunshine laws. So um, that was what you saw in action this evening. And it became really clear as, as our discussion began that there's a desire to make some changes to the policy as presented. So all of the board members are invited to send those changes to Dr. Severe, our, our wonderful helper of, of all things, who's going to help us um, craft it into something that hopefully more closely reflects the will of the entire board. And then when we reconvene on April 9th, we'll um, entertain a motion in a second and we'll talk about it. I don't know if I'll round robin again because that didn't work all that well. Um, and then and then we'll take a vote. So just wanted everyone to know that in case you were sticking around 
in the hope that we were going to come out of recess from that governance committee meeting after this meeting. We are not. We're going to do it on April 9th at 4 p.m. Thank you so much. That gets us to the director's report. And for that, I'm going to return it back to superintendent, our director of schools, Adrian Battle. All right. Thank you again, Chair Arad and board members. Um, well, I just want to first um, welcome um, our newest board member, TK Fang. Um, um, it's so great to have you here with us as we work together um, to keep up the momentum and progress on behalf of Metro National Public Schools. Uh, while we'll miss the presence of Christian Bugs at the board, we are thrilled to have you joining us, um, board member Fain, and we look forward to great things to come. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just for now. All right, we were going to present some information tonight about our alternative learning center redesign work. However, we're going to hold that for a future meeting, so please stay tuned um, for that. But now, as we transition, um, we're going to transition into our Academies of Nashville presentation tonight. I want to first say how great it was last week to welcome educational leaders and business leaders from across the country and globe here to Nashville for the Academies of Nashville study visit. We had representatives that ranged from Knoxville to Alaska to Scotland and many parts in between to learn from us about the great work that has been put into place to grow academic outcomes and provide students with a unique learning experience focused not just on core academics, but on job skills and industry knowledge that can be taken into the future, into their future lives. I want to thank in particular um, board member Cheryl Mays and Berthina Nabama Kenny who attended and participated in these events to help welcome leaders from around the world here to Nashville. Now I'd like to welcome up Dan Phillips, our director of the Academies of Nashville, to give an update and showcase the great work of this program and why leaders from all over come to Music City to learn from us here at MMPS. Director Phillips. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Board Chair Elrod, board members, Dr. Battle, staff, community members, it's an honor to be here tonight to give you an update on the, the academies in Nashville, both where we've been, where we're at, and where we're headed. Oh. Okay. So when you look at the signature, signature initiatives of MMPS, um, the core tenants, as well as all of our focused outcomes, are all covered by the, the Academies of Nashville work. And we'll talk about throughout this presentation how each of these components are, are covered through the work that we've been doing and will continue to do. To go back in history a little bit, um, 2005, 2006, MNPS was in a, a, a pretty rough state in, in terms of graduation rate. Um, we sat at just below a 58% graduation rate. Um, we were on the, the verge of, of state takeover. Uh, Johns Hopkins Magazine um, labeled eight of our schools dropout factories, and there was extremely low public support for, for public education. Um, so that led us to applying for and receiving the Small Learning Community Grant. Um, so in 2006, 2007, that grant work started in, in eight of our high schools. Um, in those eight high schools, freshman academies were established, as well as advisory boards, um, which brought in the business partners through uh, the work of the Pencil Foundation. As we moved on to 2009, 2010, after a couple years with just the Freshman Academy um, and also with the, the support of the Board of Education, all 12 schools, so eight from the original grant as well as four that were supported through the, the Board of Education, all 12 schools embarked on the journey um, with the upper academies to, to launch wall-to-wall -wall career academies, meaning every student in, in all 12 high schools was part of um, their academies, either in the freshman academy or in um, one of their upper academies. So 
So when you look at the, the transformation that, that took place at, at that time, um, there are three primary strands that, that really uh, led this work. Um, the first strand was transforming teaching and learning. Um, we changed how students learn, the opportunities that were available to the, the students, um, really building in that rigor, relevance, and relationships. Um, the goal with the advanced academics, as with all of the academics, was raise that bar of rigor uh, to prepare all kids uh, to have the ability to, to move on to college. Um, this also involved a lot of teacher training, so professional development was huge in those first few years, um, learning how to teach through the lens of the academy, uh, learning how to work in teams outside of their content area, um, as well as teaching on the, the block uh, to maximize the time that they had our students. The second component of that was transforming the secondary school experience. These were the structures that, that really built out uh, the, academy, the academy model. Um, so as we said, the first couple years were freshman academy, so the freshmen were teamed, um, just like they would be on, in a middle school, uh, to create those small learning communities. And then the upper academies were all built around a, a thematic uh, CTE um, course courses uh, within each academy. The scheduling and common planning, this was vital because we had both academy common plan, which allowed all of the members of the academies, both core content and CTE, to plan together the interdisciplinary uh, project-based lessons that our students would be working on as well as keeping the, the core content area uh, for the English teachers to all plan together as well. Both were, were vital to this transformation. The distributed, the distributed leadership model um, was also a big component of this. Um, distributing that, that ownership and that leadership from our executive principals to our academy principals, um, our academy coaches, as well as our, our academy team leads to really uh, spread out that ownership uh, and drive the work of the academies. All this was based on what's relevant and what's needed in Nashville. So our workforce uh, really drove all of the pathways that, that we offered at that time um, so we could ensure that all kids had an opportunity uh, to make a livable wage um, and look into careers that, that provided high demand and, and high skill opportunities as well. And then our facilities and labs, these were important. We wanted to make sure that all of our kids had access to, to uh, state-of-the-art industry-grade equipment uh, to where it would lessen that learning curve between what they were learning in high school and what they might experience once they got out into the real world. This all couldn't be done without our business partners. And that's strand three, that transforming the, the business and civic engagement. Our business partners have been instrumental from the start until the currently and will be in the future. Um, the experiential learning opportunities that we're able to provide for our students to get that real world deep dive into areas that they're passionate about, that they're interested in, to help them set their plan after they graduate high school. Bringing those real world into the classroom, uh, engaging our business partners uh, in the classroom as well as outside uh, to make that tie in to both, to make, again, to bring that relevance into the classroom. So when we look at the, the first strand of teaching and learning, um, this is where those core tenants and those focus outcomes come in. Uh, the whole purpose of this academy model is to create a, a, a small community out, out of big schools. So when you look at the, the student interest, they're pursuing their, what they're interested in to see if it's something that they want to pursue then after high school. Um, they also get that sense of belonging, being in that small community with having a, the same teachers throughout their last three years really provides them those relationships, that sense of belonging between their peers as well as their teachers um, to have a place within our schools. Because of these relationships and the relevance of the, the courses to tie in things that they're interested in, that leads to, to better attendance. Kids are, are interested in it. They have a relationship with the teacher. They're excited about it. They're going to come to school more, and we've seen that over the years. Literacy and numeracy, again, as we're bringing the, the CTE 
into the those core classes, kids are able to, to make those connections and tie that in. So if a, a student is, is thinking about the slope of a roof and they're taking the ACT and they see a problem where they have to figure out slope, they're thinking about that roof and it makes that tie in and it helps them succeed in, in those academic tests. And then all of these parts lead to on-track graduation. So again, uh, tying these all in, getting the kids there, um, providing those supports and those tie-in to, to each of those areas um, will help our students get to that finish line. Again, I spoke earlier about professional development. That was vital at the start of this transformation and it continues to, to be vital to this day. We had roughly 18% of our staff turnover um, just from last year to this year. Uh, that included principals, executive principals, academy principals, counselors, and teachers. Um, and this was identified as a need throughout our, our staff um, over the course of the, the last year. So with the support of, of Dr. Battle and her cabinet, um, teaching and learning staff, we put together a pretty aggressive uh, professional development plan um, again, with the support of, of the cabinet and, and the board, um, we're going to pull this off. Um, but it started this spring. Right now, currently, our academy coaches uh, who have developed this YAON presentation, it gets back to the why. why. Why did we start the academies 17 years ago? Why is that still relevant? Why is all of this still what we need for kid, to help kids be successful? That'll launch us into our summer institute. Um, and again, this is where the, the support has been huge. So this summer, June 10th through 13th, um, all certified teachers, counselors, administrators from our 12 high schools uh, will go through a day of professional development to level set and get us back to all speaking the same language and establish that foundation of why we're doing the academy work. Now that's not gonna get us back to the the, the top of the, the mountain, but it's gonna be a great start. Um, and that'll lead us into other opportunities that'll go along uh, throughout the year. Another component of this is how we onboard teachers. Um, so as part of this, um, we'll be developing Schoology courses um, that will have onboarding packages for our academy coaches, teachers, academy counselors, uh, and principals, executive principals and academy principals to help that learning curve uh, when they're coming into those positions to, to get them a, a better head start uh, as they move into those roles. And then ongoing um, throughout the tapping into the expertise and knowledge of our, our staff that we have, um, we'll continue to offer those school-based professional development based on the foundation that we started this summer. Um, those professional development opportunities will continue throughout the year to build on what we started this summer and continue um, throughout the summer and, and beyond to ensure that um, everybody in, in every school uh, is back working in the, all the oars are rowing in the same direction and, and we're all working and which will lead to the impact on, on students. The second part, transforming the secondary school experience um, again, going back to the pathways, um, we worked hard over the last year to establish criteria to define what, um, uh, what our criteria was to be able to assess and evaluate our existing and our new pathways. Um, one of those criteria was the H3, which is high skill, high wage, and high demand. Um, so you see it there on the, the screen or on your papers. High wage is just simply defined as uh, occupations that pay 20% higher than the median um, wage in the region around, the nine county region around Davidson County, as well as in Davidson County. So I put a couple examples there um, of pathways, one we have and one we will have next year. Um, cybersecurity will be a new pathway that we'll offer at, at Stratford STEM High School next year. And you can see there uh, the median income um, is quite a bit uh, bigger than, than what the, the, the region and the Davidson County is. As well as therapeutic services, um, again, relating to medicine, dentist, dentistry, uh, pharmacy, um, also quite a bit larger than, than what's uh, the, the average in these areas. 
High skill simply means something is required after high school. So whether that be an apprenticeship program or certificate program, associates, bachelors, masters, and beyond, um, these occupations require something after high school. Uh, so again, with those two examples down there, you see that all of these degree opportunities are available here in the, in the Nashville Metro. So there's readily available opportunities for our students to go on and expand their, their skills. And then high demand is, a five, is based on a five-year projection, um, again, in the nine county uh, region and the, the Davidson County. So you can see there cybersecurity, a huge projection over 17% um, projected over the next five years, as well as therapeutic service on, almost pushing 10%. So great opportunities. There are many more like this. Um, out of the 96 total pathways that we offer, um, 49 of those um, meet the H3 criteria. So we have lots of opportunities um, in our 12 high schools for students to um, get into those H3 careers. The last component for business and civic engagement, really, again, our, our business partners have been vital. They've been the, the backbone of, of what we have done. Um, and what we've really started to expand over the last couple of years is our career-based learning. Uh, so you can see on there some of the uh, the aspects of, of career-based learning, um, but there's really, there's a full continuum of, of experiences offered through the career-based learning. Those start in ninth grade, and you can see some of the examples here. Um, all of our students, uh, in addition to our, our magnet high schools, participate in a career fair. Um, we had about 4,500 kids that, that all went through the Music City Center, uh, which is a great, uh, great experience for the students. Um, college visits, career exploration, introducing those employability skills, all a part of the, the ninth grade experience. And then as they, once they're in their pathway in their academy, uh, they start to take their first level CTE course, their, their pathway course. So they'll start working on the industry certifications. They'll all attend a, a field trip, an industry tour, so they can start to see what those opportunities look like outside of, of our school doors. And then we, again, start to practice more of those employability skills, which will continue to be a theme through all four years. As they introduce or get into 11th grade, um, they have the opportunity to, to participate in a job shadow. Again, focusing a little more, they, they get to spend some time with a, a professional uh, to see, hear their story, see what they do on, a, on the average day to, again, learn more about the, the occupations that they're interested in. Um, we continue the in-depth project-based learning, bringing those elements from the the real world into their high school classes. Again, we're reinforcing more of the, the employability skills. And then in their senior year, um, with the mock interviews, um, again, working on finishing up those industry certifications and continuing that, that real world uh, learning through project-based lessons. Another component of that, that senior experience is an opportunity for, to get into paid internships uh, where students can earn while they learn. Um, <clears throat> we have quite a few opportunities available outside of the, the school district, um, but again, through the generosity of the district, uh, a lot of our students' transportation is, is an issue. And so the district stepped up and, and provided a lot of in-house opportunities where students could still get that real world experience but they don't have to leave the school. Um, at $15 an hour, it's a great opportunity for our kids to, to earn while they learn these real world um, scenarios. In addition to that, they're also taking a career-based learning practicum course, where again, they're working on employability skills. Um, also, if they haven't passed an OSHA certification, they'll do that throughout that time. Um, and they do are allowed to take advantage of getting out of school early. Um, they do earn credits from this, but they can leave school early to either go out to a job site to do their career-based learning or go to a different part of their school uh, to be a part of that. And you'll hear uh, some aspects of that from our student speakers. To be eligible for this, they do have to be seniors. 
Um, they have to be on track to graduate and have at least a 90% attendance rate to, in order to, to take advantage of these opportunities. <clears throat> Where we're at right now, um, the National Career Academy Coalition um, has issued the National Standards of Practice, which are kind of the, the overall standards for how uh, career academies function. Um, we've gone through um, several accreditations already. Where we currently are at, uh, we have nine of our academies that have been certified as model with distinction. This is basically perfect um, according to the, the standards set forth. Um, we have 24 academies that are certified as model. One that's certified as certified being a approaching model. And then one academy that was uh, a combined of two academies that were waiting recertification. Um, but we're right in the middle of the process. Uh, we just finished, we had uh, two reviews yesterday and one today, uh, Hunters Lane and Pearl Cone yesterday and Glen Cliff today. Um, but over the next couple of weeks, we'll have a total of 11 different academies from seven schools that will be going through the, the accreditation process. We have reviewers come in from all over the United States that look at the evidence that our schools have provided talk to our students, talk to our parents, talk to our staff, talk to our business partners um, to see um, how we're doing the, the Career Academy model. Um, the ones that have gone so far have gone very well, so we're excited for the rest of them to come. And then next year, um, all 12, none of our freshman academy currently are accredited, so all 12 of our freshman academy will go through accreditation next year. As Dr. Battle mentioned, uh, we had quite a few people come to, to Nashville last week to, to learn. And one of the things that, that Dr. Battle really has, has, has pushed and, and we've pushed in the, the schools is to be transparent, um, be, be vulnerable, and really teach people about our struggles as well as our successes. And that's something that, that we've gotten a lot of feedback from schools that they really appreciate the, the transparency and it helps them identify hurdles that they're gonna come to versus just seeing all the success. A lot of people can't get from where they are to that success. So they really appreciate the, the, the honesty and the, the realness that, that our schools uh, present on that. Um, we've had great feedback from that. And we also held a, a leadership track. So we had 42 people, superintendents, mayors, uh, community partners um, from across the nation that participated in a leadership track. Both of these events, the study visit and the leadership track, um, combined role alikes, um, professional learning for the, the visitors, as well as school visits out to our schools. So now I would like to invite Jayla McClendon and Omid Sharani um, from Overton High School to come up and, and talk about their experiences. I'd also like to recognize uh, from Overton, we have Beth Wilson, who is the CCR coach. Laura Topoletto, the Academy coach, and Dr. Garner back there, executive principal. So Jayla and Omid. Hi, my name is Omid Sharani. I'm a senior at John Overton, and I'm in the um, IT Academy with my pathway being digital arts and design. Good afternoon, my name is Jayla McClendon. I'm a senior at John Overton High School, and I'm in the IT Academy in the Coding Pathway. So I work with, um, I, I do work-based learning with uh, our IT specialist at John Overton High School, we help fix students' laptops. That means replacing keyboards, batteries. We also help uh, set up monitors for admins, and we also help clean projectors. I really like I really like this opportunity because I got to learn things that I thought I wouldn't like, and I got to learn skills like problem self solving and critical thinking due to all the troubleshooting and all the problems with the computers, and I really like it. Uh, what else? 
Also, this uh, job made me want to pursue cybersecurity when I go to college, which, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. So a few things I wanted to make points on were the industry certifications that you can get through the um, IT Academy. So currently I have a Photoshop certification and I'm working to get my Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator certification. And I think one thing that really I enjoy about this academy is that um, regardless of work-based learning, I can still have work just because I have these certifications and work like independently uh, for myself and make money using these certifications. Um, to speak on job shadows, I my junior year I had a job shadow at a company called Darvis, which as somebody who wants to pursue a career in IT, it was really interesting to see how young people um, who have these startup tech companies work in their everyday lives and how their workspace is. And it was, that was a great experience, something I always remember. Um, like uh, Jayla said, we have a lot of uh, work-based learning opportunities and internship opportunities. Um, this is something that I wish I took a part of, but I didn't. Um, these internships, uh, really, it's something as like somebody who's been in high school in another district, we don't have these opportunities everywhere. And I think it's great that Metro has these opportunities because it really distinguishes us in comparison to other school districts. And I think it's great that you could be a 17-year-old senior in high school, uh, leaving school early, going to work, and making a good uh, wage. Um, and then one thing I wanted to, my final point, I guess, um, in my graphic design class, um, our teacher, Mr. Desh, who was a great teacher, um, He's one of my favorite teachers at Overton. I think us having um, teachers who really like connect with you as students is one thing that makes our academy model great as well. Um, we learned to make company logos, and that was one project that we had was to make company logos. And I think that's one thing that's needed. Like, it's in high demand, I guess, to um, for graphic design artists to make company logos, and that's something that's always going to be needed. And learning that skill in high school, I think, was great. Our student leaders can stay close. We might have some questions for you before you head out. Um, we'll let uh, Director Phillips wrap up the presentation and we'll open it up for some more questions, okay? Thank you, Thank you all so much. Yes. Great job. I think you can see right there that that's, that's why we do this. Um, that's, that's the passion, the, the excitement, and, and the energy is, is, is why we do all this. So how can the board can support? Um, again, we have so much to be thankful for in, in the last 17 years. Um, we've really seen the impact of, of the academy model um, going from a 50, sub 58% to over 81% graduation rate by 22-23. Um, um, our industry certifications have grown exponentially. Our work-based learning opportunities have grown exponentially. Our uh, suspension rate has dropped almost in, in half. So there's tons of, of great um, highlights that, that we can account for this. Um, we just ask that you continue to, to provide the, the funding for these opportunities, um, things like the, the advanced academics, the industry certification, uh, the career-based learning opportunities for our students. Um, and then the other thing that uh, we'd like, if, if you can help advocate uh, at the state level um, for funding uh, within career and technical education um, with the new funding formula that's out, as well as uh, teacher licensing options um, to continue to offer these innovative programs uh, to be able to, to get the expertise that we need in working with our students. Um, we would appreciate your continued help and, and support in, in both of these areas. And I'll just um, add, it was mentioned by um, one of our student leaders, uh, one of the things that also sets Metro National Public Schools apart from other districts is our ability to cover the costs for students to engage in advanced academic courses, industry certifications, and um, other relevant um, opportunities. And so advocacy and just commitment to that as we move forward is, is greatly appreciated um, so that students can shine and uh, be first in line for these high-wage, high-demand, high-skill uh, career opportunities. All right, with that, um, Chair Rob, we'll turn it back over to you. 
All right. Thank you so much for all that information. All right. That brings us to discussion. Do I have any questions? I'm going to start first with our student board member, Elena, and then I will get to member Tyler. I just want to add on what everyone's been saying. Um, as an academy ambassador at Hillsboro, I, uh, we had a study visit at Hillsboro, and people really were um, very impressed and it and it and, and shocked by all the things that we had. And it really reminded me how privileged we are here um, in MNPS. And I also want to give another shout out to Omid and Jayla because you guys sold the academies way better than I ever could. <laughs> My academy coach wishes I talked like that on our tours. Um, so I just want to emphasize, you know, how important these academies are, but y'all did my job for me, so I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Member Tyler. Um, just a quick clarification for me. So when you're talking about like the teachers in the academies, are those certificated teachers who have gone through a program to be a teacher or are those industry leaders who are coming in to teach or a mixture? Both. Okay. So the, the academic, um, the core teachers, English, mm -hmm. math, science, yeah. social studies, they're all certificated. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of our CTE teachers do mm -hmm. come from industry. Um, so yeah. they come in and they go through an educator prep program to, to learn mm -hmm. that. Um, we also, through our Perkins funding, um, we brought on an instructional coach for our CTE teachers that have less than three years experience um, just to build that relationship, provide that support so we don't have to continue recruiting teachers. If we can retain mm -hmm. them, we don't have to recruit them. So that's been a, a, mm -hmm. a big key in terms of supporting our teachers and, and keeping them there. And do you see do you see a difference in the turnover between certificated teachers and industry people who come in to teach or is it? The, either way it, it all depends the, the the industry people coming from industry mm -hmm. um, it's a lot because a lot of times they're taking a, a pay significant cut. pay cut yes. and then mm -hmm. they find out they have to take an 18 credit um, EPP Honestly. program over three years so it's a mm -hmm. it's a it's a big investment for them um, we are looking at, as several counties have done Rutherford and Sumner they do their own educator prep program so we're looking into starting our own to where we could do that in-house and, and lessen that burden on the teachers but we're looking at anything we can to, mm -hmm. to keep our teachers and, and support them and grow them. Yeah, and I think um, part of that too is, and we've been um, digging into this um, with regards to retention, particularly in the high school space of the connection to teaching in a career academy model as opposed to a comprehensive model um, and the benefits of being a part of a small learning community. So that's another angle that we're paying attention to mm -hmm. um, to help kind of uh, establish our YAON um, work. So. That makes sense. And I know we had talked about Oh, maybe years ago now, um, I can't believe it's been that long, about partnering with other groups so that we could, um, of industry groups. Um, I think I talked, we talked a little bit about partnering with some of the union groups so that we could help provide, um, they could provide some teachers for us and then we could provide some people to follow that pathway for them so it's mutually beneficial in a way that helps our students um, and also grows those industries in Nashville where we need it. Um, so I think I just wanted to kind of check in on how yep. are we doing with those partnerships with outside groups? I think um, the uh, most recent Maplewood partnership is a great example of that. It's one of the first um, in the state. And mm -hmm. so, yes, we've been um, creating those par partnerships and moving the needle um, with regards to those experiences that are relevant to our students to help them build um, career opportunities. So the Maplewood announcement, I'll turn right to that as an example, um, a, a, a bright example of what that can look like. Um, to benefit our young people. Yeah, that's really, it's really exciting what, what is happening and the kinds of returns that we're seeing as far as student engagement and excitement to be at school as opposed to just feeling like it's a boring requirement or that one that you're going to cause trouble because you don't want to be there. Um, and I think the two of you spoke really eloquently about your experiences and I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us about what it's actually like for you and how it's changed your views and, and the way you view school. So thank you for coming out. Thank you. That gets us to our other student board member, Christine. Um, I just want to talk about my experience with academies real quick because I think it's relatively unique. Um, we are allowed to change our academies once throughout like our entire three years. So sophomore year, I chose to be in the Health Science Academy. Um, I hated it. <laughs> I did it. I got certified in um, OSHA and I did go on a field trip 
went to, I don't remember what it's called, but it, it was fun. I guess, but I realized it really wasn't for me, and I, I always thought I wanted to go down into the medical field, like when I went to college, things like that, so this year, I switched over to the Art Design and Communications Academy, um, I kind of got fast-tracked, and I did my Photoshop certification, I'm thinking about doing Illustrator, I kind of don't like it, it's really funky, but if I, if I didn't have these academies, then I'd probably go to college and do something I didn't like, and I think that's the best thing about the academy experience, it's really just an opportunity to figure out what you like, what you don't like, and can't say much about that, but. <laughs> save you some money. And it'll save you a whole lot of money in the money. process. <laughs> and make you some money, too. Yes. And make you some money, too, while you're working. A little right. bit of. Dr. Namag McKinney. Yeah, so I'm really excited about AON. Um, I was actually not dating myself, you know, just a couple of years ago, actually part of Cane Ridge and starting it. I think it was the first high school that was built specifically for an academy um, model um, in Metro after they started the AON process. Um, and being part of that, the, the formation of Cane Ridge, is that not true? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Antioch might have been right before. Maybe the remodel and then Cane Ridge was the first school. I mean, I mean, the Maybe school built. It yeah. was. It was. We moved Antioch from Blue Hole Road to Hop, yeah Hopskin Hopskin Pikes. Oh, I'm sorry. So, in a nutshell, Cane yeah. Ridge is the newest school besides James Lawson, which yes. we transitioned that was built after the start of the academies, right. but Antioch High School was built and then moved, you know, and we moved re it, relocated. Re relocated Antioch um, after the start of the academies as well. Gotcha. Antioch was her school. <laughs> <laughs> They're all <laughs> They're all her schools. But anyway, um, yeah, so being a part of that academy model and, and going through the transition and to see where it was then to where it is now is really great. Um, also being a parent of having children who participated in the academy model and didn't participate in the academy in the model. And that goes back to you figuring out what you want to do before you enter post-secondary education or whatever you're looking to do. Um, so I saw the difference between my 30-year-old daughter not going through an academy model and then looking at my 25 and 23-year-old uh, children who went through the academy model. Um, my son graduated. I still have some in the system still, so I'm still going through this um, and so I'm excited to see what my son now has the opportunity as a elementary student going into this as well um, but with my uh, son that graduated in 2018 he went through the Academy model went through computer science was an interest in computer science went to college uh, majored in computer engineering graduated from college debt-free and got a job right out of college making six figures in computer engineering, the computer science world. So it's great to be able to see our young people get this experience within Metro Nashville Public School and be successful as they go into post-secondary, reduce costs for their families, um, and get right into the field making money. And so I really appreciate kind of seeing the way the academies are having an impact on our students and the success of our students. So thank you so much for presenting um, and thank you for telling us your experience as well, all of you, um, and how that's playing out with our, with our students. Thank you, <laughs> Member Mays. Yes. So one of the things that, uh, yeah, I started out uh, as a business partner uh, in the academies of Nashville in 2009. And uh, it was probably the best decision I've ever made because it provided an opportunity for me to work with young people just like yourselves and find out what it is you wanted to do. And Christine, you make a very valid point. My son went through the Academy of Finance uh, in, uh, at Antioch, and he learned very quickly he did not want to be in finance for the rest of his life. <laughs> and so I appreciate the Academies of Nashville saving me a ton of money for him not going to school to be in uh, finance. Uh, but um, one of the things that we definitely want to make sure that we are saying thank 
are remaining thankful for are the business partners. The business partners help drive this success of the Academies of Nashville and provide opportunities for young people just like yourselves. And what I can say is that um, the business partners have uh, historically been very vocal about those industry certifications because they know what the industry demands. And if we are providing certifications that are useless, they're going to tell us very quickly. So it is absolutely, I love the fact that we have these study visits from around the globe. Uh, people are starting to understand that we have it together and we are providing the most masterful opportunities to our children that we could possibly provide, getting them to that point and crossing them over before they even get out of high school. So I am so excited and I would challenge every single mem board member, if you have not visited a school that has an academies program, please do so. There are lots of interests that you can uh, engage in and I would encourage you to visit those schools and learn firsthand how amazing these academies programs are. So thank you. Thank you. Member O'Hara Block. Um, I just from the perspective of that uh, Miss Mays was just talking about. I know as I've been to um, tours at Hillsborough, um, and I've been on I've like countless tours of Hillsborough now. But um, one of the things that is always really attractive as I see it for students are all of the things that the academies have to offer. So um, they have uh, such cool spaces and and like things that are of interest to students. Um, I think you were talking about relevance and it is really um, an important uh, part of the model. I have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned um, certification for the freshman academies. I, I think I sort of know or understand less about what the freshman academy model might require in terms of um, sort of both the, the plan overall and certification. I'd just be interested to hear you talk a little bit about that. Sure. The, the Freshman Academy is all about getting to know who they are uh, as a person, what their interests are, what their aptitudes are, and then getting a, a exposure to all the opportunities within their school. Uh, so they'll start a, a portfolio, and this is something, sorry, uh, for your seniors, um, we're, we're getting put in place uh, across all 12 schools. They'll start a portfolio, a digital portfolio that'll be theirs for life. Um, so they'll uh, document all their experiences throughout their, their four years. Um, but that freshman year really is about getting to know who they are, um, what their interests are, what their aptitudes, what professions that might apply to, and then really starting to map out the, the rest of their four years in, in high school. Cool. Thank you. And um, the the types of opportunities that you all talked about and that I know students are able to have and that some of the board members have talked about are, are and, and what you, uh, the data you shared about um, career pathways is so important. I, I'm curious to know if we are able to measure through any way where our students end up in terms of um, both uh, college or post-secondary pathways, um, and then also career after they graduate from high school. I'm looking at board member block because I mean I answer for a reason. She knows the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing is yes, um, Dr. Um, Nabal McKinney was right about King Ridge. Check did some. Day checking, so she was. She's accurate about hey, hey, I only know one way. I only know one way. Um, so, so the answer to your question is, we try to. Um, it is not the most effective model because of the lack of coordination, not even coordination, data release or access um, to us as a K twelve pre K twelve institution. Um, the state actually does track um, this information. Right now, we're working to see what can be done, and districts across the, the state are working to see what can be done for that information to be shared. In the meantime, um, our educators are just doing um, enormous work and have a, a huge lift and tracking down students, having the conversations. We have some surveys um, that we've um, issued to our students to gather um, that information and to track their progression um, through their post-secondary experiences and career. So. Um, it is not the most efficient way. We recognize that, but our educators know how important it is for us to track this to help guide 
and, um, where we are with our academies of Nashville. And in the meantime, we've got a team working um, to see if we can um, get released um, data to the P20 system. Yeah, I'm, and I've talked about this before, so I, and I did know the answer to the question more or less, but um, it, these types of programs are so important and, uh, and give our students so much, but it is very hard to sit in this kind of seat and look at um, the outcomes that the state measures from an accountability perspective, the types of things we see on ACTs, various other things, and not know what else is happening in terms of where are students going, what are what is what is the academy's model offering them, um, what are they able to do after they leave, and then to be able to make all the right advocacy continuing for these programs, um, and uh, and I think that. Not only should the board be concerned with that, but also our local businesses should be concerned with that. Our chamber of commerce should be concerned with that. A number of entities that could, um, that this does uh, impact the ability for students to get the type of um, work-based learning experiences. It would be really nice to know what actually that, uh, that does in terms of where our students end up. Um, one just other question is, when we talk about academies, one of the things, and I think I've probably asked this question before too, so forgive me for asking it again. <laughs> and you probably know where I'm going since you laughed. Um, but core subject oversight lives in, within academy principles, uh, with other principles. Where where does that sort of, how do, how do we distinguish between what is within the academy and what is without the academy and who sort of oversees which elements of that? Okay, I want to go back to your first question um, before I jump into that response. I do encourage this board and the community, when you're out and about um, in the Nashville area, in the region, um, you should engage with our young people about where they've graduated from, their career academy experiences. Um, I almost can't go anywhere without um engaging with one of our students who graduated from our academies of Nashville. And I mean, there's a, a couple just examples that come top of mind. Jackie Gomez, who is now in the mayor's office, was one of our students. Um, one of my students when I was principal at Antioch High School, I have followed her pathway all the way. I'm not shocked about where she is. She um, left from um, Amazon, I believe. It was Amazon. And now it's Assurion, thank you. She was at Assurion, and now she's in a mayor's office. Um, I bank at the credit union. Every time I go in to do some business, it is one of my students I'm sitting across from. So just engaging with our students and uplifting um, their, their journeys and um, their successes. With regards to your question about the integration of CTE and our core instruction, um, you will see, I can attack this a couple ways, from our org chart um, perspective, um, they're all on the same team. So Dan is on, um, uh, Director Phillips is a part of um, Chief Bellamy's team, which is a part of um, David Williams and his team around teaching and learning. So there's a very integrated um, approach. And one of the things I'm really excited about and proud of, of of our journey over the last few years is that when we're supporting the professional learning, the feedback, the coaching, um, the strategic planning um, with our schools, it's not done in isolation. Um, and so when we go into our schools, you We'll see representatives from teaching and learning, um, from our academies of Nashville department to our CTE um, team, and and they're doing that to calibrate around um, the integration of the CTE courses. Um, the academies work through our content lens. That is one of the major whys around um, AON. It's about bringing um, the career um, experiences to life that students are interested in, but you're doing that through the lens of their content. And I use this example all the time um, when you think back to your high school experience, how many times have you wondered, why do I need to know this, right? So it's about the rigor, it's about the relevance, um, it's about the relationships that are built through our small learning um, communities, and it's to ensure that our students are ready for those post-secondary opportunities. And so teaching through the lens of the academy is one of the professional um, learning opportunities um, we provide in MNPS, but it's all to the intent is for it to be integrated. Dr. Gentry. Oh, yes. I do have a question about the employability skills. So um, being a hiring manager, seeing a lot of throughput in our organization, one of the things that 
sort of causes an, a, a candidate to not move forward is often resume, social media presence, um, showing up to the interview, showing up on time to the interview, uh, and actually being able to articulate, respond to the questions, articulate what goals are, how do they believe they can contribute to the goals of an organization. So where do those skills outside of the certifications, which are fantastic, but how, do, and I think, and those are, we, we do a lot to get students into organizations, into jobs that pay well, not taking anything away from that. I think on the managerial side of an organization, that's not just someone sitting on a bench or sitting in front of a computer generating output or product, some skills on the, the, the employability or, or what we used to call soft skills. How do those and get incorporated into a student's experience within the academies? I think overall, um, to where you were talking about things like interview skills and things like that, I think, like how I mentioned, um, having a good relationship with your teacher, which our teachers do strive for that, um, is one thing that um, kind of, they don't just really build us as students, but they build us as people as well. Um, and real like emphasis on um, things like you said, like hireability. Um, so I can say like my teacher, Mr. Deshes, um, he's incorporated these things into class, especially with our uh, senior capstone. Um, those things overall, um, it, it kind of all play and it'll all like, tag in until your senior year. You'll pick up bits and pieces along the way. That's really all I have to say about that. Yeah, and it starts um, freshman year is where we begin to introduce the employability skills. But he's right. You, you're going, it, the whole idea is not for it to just be a one kind of kind of go at it. It's to build um, as students matriculate from their ninth grade freshman experience all the way um, through high school. We do have an employability um, rubric um, that our teams um, leverage and plan around um, as well so that we can have those intentional um, conversations with our students. Director Phillips, you want to add anything? Yeah. And this is also how we engage our business partners. So when they're coming in to talk to our classes or we're taking students out into there, our business partners are intentional about dropping those, those hints and those subjects to, to reinforce what the, the teachers are, are applying because um, kids oftentimes, if an, a potential future employer is saying it, uh, they might hear it from their teacher 10 times, but if a potential employer says it, then it, it clicks and, and hits. So we try to, to make sure that we're on the same page with all of our business partners. And I'm going to turn to Elena. You'll also yeah. see it as students um, are preparing for the career fair, when they're preparing for job shadows, internships. That's part of the preparation leading up to those experiences. Yeah, I was going to say I had a unique freshman seminar experience because I was virtual, but I do remember freshman seminar hit very hard on soft skills and I think we might have did some ingenuity and things like that about um, how to, you know, career-based things. How do you go into an interview? What's important? How do you need to, you know, social media? I do think you could argue that the emphasis on that gets a little lost once you get into your um, career-based, the specific pathways, but I do remember that being hit very hard in the freshman academy. Can I add one thing? Um, so my, I believe it was my junior year, um, Ms. Wilson actually helped us build our resumes and I still use that same resume, um, to this day. I use it to apply for my summer jobs and things of such. So I just wanted to add that, um, cause I didn't know how to build a resume prior to that. And, and so all of that, it really does sound great and I, it, but it also sounds subjective and sort of not consistent across schools and academies, right? I mean, unless, I mean, unless I'm not hearing something, I understand the freshman part and I would just offer up a, a consideration and it goes straight to what you said, um, board member Elena Mitchell, uh, about it sort of gets lost in the freshman. I think hitting it as a freshman versus maybe a senior, um, you know, so I teach a, a course called professional development for graduating seniors uh, at a, at a four year university. So catching it, I think it's understanding the technical and then maybe adding something else on that and when you're exiting and you're beginning to interview for jobs, just a consideration so that it's not lost. It's not dependent on 
how your teacher thinks about it or the right business partner talking about it. We have it baked into the curriculum and it's more intentional. So just as with consideration. I think to add on to Dr. Gentry's, what I believe your consideration is that you presented, is from my professional experience as well, those soft skills and professional skills are often hard to teach. They're commonly discussed, but it's truly in practice is where you hone them and become comfortable with them and really grow into them. So I think in that consideration, we have an important part of working with our partners and making sure that they understand what they're looking for within our students and that our students understand what the outcome is. But maybe the consideration is, is that there's like a set number of practice skills or something along those lines, or there's a discussion with someone of what you think is you're having um, the most practices needed with and something along those lines. That said, though, uh, y'all did an amazing job. I am so proud that y'all are here. Uh, Overton is my school, in case you don't know that, uh, sitting in the room. So I'm so proud to have you, um, and of course, Dr. Gardner as well. I've had the pleasure of hearing from Omi before, and you did a great job of, again, talking to a group of adults about the importance of academies beyond just when you leave Overton. And so I thought it was a great point, and I just want to make sure that we reinstate it, he has made the comment before, and I hope I'm not speaking too much for you, of the skills and the certifications that you're learning here have helped you currently as well. It's not just something that you're looking forward to in the future, though, of course, we want that to be of assistance then, but that you found practicality in helping it now, and that's so important. And, of course, I'm glad to have you at MMPS, as I know you came back to us, and so I appreciate you being here. Also, to our uh, junior board member statement, something that I learned really quickly about Academies of Nashville was that it was something that we were known for. Um, when I first joined the board in 2018, uh, that first year, a few months in, one of the first things I did is I went to a convention called the Council of Great City Schools, and so it's the 50 largest schools. And we had so many people coming up to me, talking to me about the academies, and quite frankly, I knew about the academies from my own personal experience with MNPS, but I also knew about it somewhat from my orientation and introduction with them being a board member in my newer role within MMPS. But I learned so much from these other people that had been to what happened last week and that had done their own research on it. And a big piece to that was they were so impressed with how we have to have those business relationships to really get this to go for our students. I know that's a tremendous amount of work. In the past, our board has asked questions about what, if anything, is specifically needed from us to help recruit those uh, partners, particularly in the positions where we have the highest need for certified teachers? Do you have anything that you could share with us for those needs? Yes. As we're finding with our career-based learning experiences expanding, um, we have just under 400 business partners, but as we grow these experiences, um, that 400 can't sustain, we need more. And so we've worked with the chamber. We, we've hosted a, a healthcare happy hour to, to bring in more healthcare partners. And um, we have an IT happy hour coming up again, to bring on more IT partners. Um, so that would be my ask is, um, as you're out in the community, um, talking with other professionals, um, get them connected with us. Um, because that will help us expand all of our opportunities to accommodate the number of students that are continuing to, to grow to get into those career-based learning experiences. Okay, thank you. Um, a big piece of feedback that I had heard from so many people, not just that year, but since, and of course people within our own communities, is the value of the Academy's model. Again, not just in what your future hiring is, but of course being able to have a safe place to make your big mistakes. Uh, personally, I went to school originally to be pre-med. Had a lot of had a lot of hoots before it, uh, a lot of kismet for it, but I, I didn't have the skill set, and uh, so I didn't I didn't do well with that at all. And I would have learned so much if I would have had an academy's model to go through that. Of course, we have so many anecdotal pieces of evidence to that, but I think there's a lot of value within this. I know that you said that there is. You said 60, a certain number of pathways, and I'm so sorry I missed it. It's 60 how many? 
We have 96 total. 96. Where am I getting 60-something from? Was that the certified? No. 49 pathways are the H3 pathways. Correct. That's okay. correct. That part, I, maybe I've inverted a number. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then my, I guess my follow-up question I have with um, uh, member O'Hara Block was, I know particularly through our work with the Chamber of Commerce and the educational report that they provide, they've really tried to impress upon us the importance of getting access to that state. Um, uh, uh, thank you. Is it Peach Winnie? I don't know. Peach Winnie system. What a name. So catchy. Um, that Peach Winnie system. Is there something that we can do as a board to help with that? Is there a specific reason why we don't have access to it since it seems to be such a struggle of qualifying and quantifying the success of the Academy's model when we're trying to recruit these businesses? Um, it's just advocates see to the state um, about creating the whatever data sharing agreements um, that are necessary. Okay. I'll stop there. Anything you want to add, Erin? There is a piece of legislation that has been floating around for the last couple of years right. that would uh, codify some of the rules around the um, uh, pre-K to workforce data and access to that data. It'd be great for that to pass as well. I think that would probably help in some ways, but it is really a, yeah. a data sharing agreement thing. And it, there's no guarantee that even if that passed, that, that data would be made available to uh, what I would like to refer to as data originators, which we are um, basically like an, an organization or an entity that puts data in should also then be able to get reports out. Yes. It's a disconnect around if there still are students. So, but they should be because the majority of the data that's in there comes from our school district or the school districts around the state. And other states do allow that. I remember that within my research, actually. Um, my last question is, is I noticed under professional development, uh, the comment, and again, I may have my numbers inverted, and please correct me if I do, it was that there had been a 15% of attrition within um, the academies of Nashville group. Is there is that a common amount of attrition? Is that an increase that we need to look for within that professional development? I know you talked about some of that process. Is there something we should do about that as a board? It's part of the natural attrition that you should plan for. What we're lifting up is that when you start a structure, um, a transformational experience like this with the Academies of Nashville, you have to have ongoing professional learning because naturally you will have some attrition. And so we're just giving a nod to really tightening up what the professional learning loop looks like so that we don't have gaps as the leadership. I mean, academy principals become principals. Academy coaches become assistant principals. I mean, you, you, you have all the natural transitions in and out of the district, so on and so forth. And so we're just trying to be much more intentional around what the professional learning loop looks like and not just relying on the original kind of founders of the academies of Nashville. I think backfilling or creating a bench for those positions is probably really important, not only for consistency of what we're trying to learn, um, but also just for leadership. And one other thing I'll acknowledge, it's also a, a part of the conversation to establish our why back then is different than our why today. And so while the core is still there with our four R's, we, our graduation rate has increased. Our student performance has increased. We now have industry credentials we weren't tracking. So things have shifted, and so it's always good to come back to why this is a sustainable model and the way in which we deliver a uh, quality high school experience um, for our high school students. Thank you. Um, the last comment I have is that I'm excited that we're looking at um, doing our own internal prep program for those positions. I think that that's probably going to be key for us getting those incredibly hard to fill positions. Um, so I'm glad that we're looking into that and eager to hear any updates as they come up. So seeing no further questions, I appreciate you giving us your time and of course to our students as well. Thank you for sticking with us so late on the school night. I know you don't have football practice tonight, but we appreciate it all the same. And thank you, Dr. Gardner. And if you start your own logo company, come see me when you graduate. I got some clients. She needs you. logos. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Great job. Thanks.
All right, while we're pulling this up, that gets us to public participation. So let me get my things in order. All right, up on the screen surrounding our building, we have our list of persons that have signed up for public participation this evening. Um, these stakeholders have signed up to speak and um, you can find your list on the screen. Uh, please be aware of when you're being called up. Instead of calling out names, I'm just gonna ask that you look for your name and kind of get in queue as you can. Um, we do ask that when you come up, you tell us your name so we can identify who you are. You do not need to tell us any other identifying information like your address or anything like that. You don't need to feel like that. And But if you do have your district information, that is always so appreciated. Beyond that, we appreciate that you're all here. If you have information or materials that you want distributed to the board, please leave them up there and we'll be sure that the board members get those at the end of this meeting so that they can be reviewed thoroughly. You have three minutes. The timer for your three minutes is seen here. At the end of your three minutes, you will hear our very lovely bell and um, we'll have the next person come up. So we have our first speaker. I'm so, trying so hard not to say your name, so thank you for coming. Okay, thank you, thank you. Members of the board, thank you for uh, letting us speak. My name is Tom Surface. I am a former Metro Schools parent and former teacher at Overton. I, uh, I'm a NOAA member and I live and vote in uh, member O'Hara Block's district. So I'm here to speak about how important it is to allow room for all voices to be heard at school board meetings. I believe we need to ensure there's space for everyone in our community to hear, to tell their story. So now the proposed policy, as I see it, restricts citizens by only allowing them to talk about what's on the board's agenda. Yes, people can contact their school board member by email or phone, and that, that may work for some things. But there's stories that need to be told in a public forum and heard by the whole board. How will you hear, for instance, about the single parent struggling to get her three kids off to three different schools in the morning? You think it's important to be able to look into her face as she tells her story. What about educators and support staff? Doesn't the board need to hear those voices? The stories, complaints, ideas from all stakeholders should be spoken and listened to in this room. It's a key part of providing the best education for our kids. So the policy changed March of 2022, as I understand it, two, about two years ago, um, which ended up dropping. The result was dropping public participation in meetings, these meetings, by 70% in just one year. These proposed policy changes, which I understand now are maybe in a state of flux, um, look like they will further limit the ability to participate democratically at school board meetings. Is that really what this school board wants? When you cut off the public from the life of school policy making, you risk eroding trust and confidence, further adding to a public narrative that paints public education in a negative light. Being able to easily speak at school board meetings is central to modeling the democracy we want to see for our kids. One where people participate and don't disengage. I ask that you open things up to allow diverse communities, people, thoughts, ideas, opinions. I'm so very grateful for the good work done by this school board. Thank you so much for your dedication and commitment. Please consider further revisions to the public participation policy, and I'll be here April 9th. Thank you. Thank you. Our second person. Good evening, board members. I'm Charlene Colbertson, and I am a teacher at Schwab Elementary. I'm here to speak in opposition to the proposed changes to the public participation portion of school board meetings. You're elected officials. As elected officials, you are part of the democratic process. That means you are supposed to listen to your constituents and the population you have been elected to serve. Limiting public participation to only 30 minutes is a gross injustice. We already pick up from, pick from a list of approved topics to speak, which I understand keeps things focused for that particular meeting. 
However, by limiting the time available to the public will only decrease participation, which means you will be removing a major part of the democratic process. How else will educators be able to come to you in large numbers to talk about the need for smaller class sizes? Our classrooms runneth over. Our classroom teachers are spread thinner and thinner each day between planning time not being protected, the excessive paperwork, I'm talking soon to grow, navigators, attendance plans, and then also adding students to already full classrooms. Maybe give a stipend for every student that exceeds the classroom cap, 25 kids in a kindergarten room, but more enroll. Let's say $50 per student that comes in over that 25. Doesn't help the lack of physical room, but that teacher gets extra for the extra. MNPS is great at saying every student seen and known. Well, your teachers are wanting to be seen and known too. We are asking you to fully support MNPS by meeting the needs of the teachers and support staff like you do your students. Thank you. Number three. No, Number four. Shane. Good evening, school board members and district leaders. My name is Shane Moore. I work at DuPont Hadley Middle School and I live in District 3. I'm also the MNEA Advocacy Committee co chair. I am here tonight to voice concerns over changes in the rules that would limit community participation. I believe that government institutions should find a way to increase community voice rather than limit it. Limiting community participation would not allow school board members to be informed of issues pertinent to the lives of educators, students, and their families. One such issue I will speak to tonight. Educators recently responded to an issue survey that was given by MNEA asking them to identify their top concerns. The number one issue continues to be teacher pay and livability. The reality is that educators are finding it increasingly harder to live in Nashville with dignity. The medium rent for a one bedroom apartment is now well over $1,500. The cost of everyday essentials are on the rise, inflation is high, healthcare premiums are massive, and the wage gap between teachers and other professions with similar education requirements widens each year. I know that much of the cost of living issue lies beyond the purview of this board's authority, but I also know that there are things that can be done to address teacher pay. The district is to be commended for its previous efforts in increasing salaries, but more must be done. This is why MNPS educators have rallied around the MNEA campaign asking board members, district leaders, and Metro government to fully support MNPS schools. As part of this campaign, we are asking for respectful compensation, a budget that does not address the needs to significantly raise teacher pay to a dignified livable wage will not be viewed as respectful compensation. Teachers pay, Pay increase should seek to close the wage gap, increase COLA to a level that addresses inflation on top of the additional 2% that we were left out of last year, and increase the district's contribution to health care premiums in order to offset the rising costs for educators. I ask that you reject a budget proposal that does not address these issues, as we will not consider a budget that does not significantly raise teacher pay as respectful compensation. We ask that you work with the mayor and Metro Council to address the livability issues this city has for its educators. It can't be enough to be the highest paid in the state if teachers struggle to make ends meet. I drive to work every morning and I see new homes being built. I see the development of condos that touch the clouds and all I can think is, I can't afford that. No chance I'll ever live there. Finally, I want to pose a few questions to the board to consider when they are looking at teacher pay. Currently, can a new teacher afford to live in the community they serve? Can a five or 10 year teacher afford to live in Nashville? Can an MNPS teacher afford to buy a home or raise a family in Nashville? I respectfully ask that you work with Metro government and continue to significantly increase the salaries of teachers. A city is judged by how it treats its teachers. Please fully support MNPS schools by ensuring respectful compensation. Thank you. Thank you. One moment, please. I want to make sure that's not an unusual fire alarm. Do we know what the sound was? It came, it came from our wrestling counter. Okay, thank you. The counter is made. Thank you so much. I am, I am, I am apologetic. Um, Ms. Holt, will you turn yours off and turn it back on? The microphone? Nope, that's not. Never mind. 
Sorry. The team is out. Never mind, Ms. Holt. They're working okay. on it. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Thank you so much. You're, I will start your time. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, greetings, board members. My name is Lynn Hoyt. I'm a former MMPS parent and NOAA member. I live in Board Tyler's district. And I'm here to speak on our need to make public participation in board meetings easier, not harder. I want you all to know how much I appreciate and admire the work you do for our schools. I also believe many of you got your start advocating at this podium, taking a stand and speaking up, making our schools better. You all have run campaigns on making our schools better and the opportunity to receive feedback or even criticism will help continue to make our schools better. I hope you will receive this feedback with that spirit. The current proposed policy on public participation, I feel is inequitable. It sets unfair limits and barriers and does not align to the mission of the school district, which I, which I quote, Collaboration. We believe engaging parents, community members, students, and other stakeholders in the educational process leads to better outcomes for all our students and benefits the broader Nashville community. I believe that too. I think it is important to hear from everyone with an open, easy, transparent policy that gives you decorum, the decorum you desire and that you deserve in these meetings while providing the opportunity to receive feedback for citizens, parents, and teachers, and students to be heard and to feel welcome. The new policy is not welcoming. It says you only give us 30 minutes of board time. We need more, not less. Even if you increase the allowable time by 15 minutes, you're increasing the dialogue by 50%. Another idea might be to uh, do open forums during the school year um, and, and not tie it to an agenda. The real key is that we feel listened to by you, that we feel heard, every student heard, every student seen, that you are created public trust, fairness, and an opportunity for the public to share their concerns, to exercise their democratic right to petition the government with their grievances. Y'all, we've had enough silencing dragnet and barriers created by our state legislature, and I trust this board doesn't want to appear to be like them. But this newly proposed policy makes it harder to, to, to participate. I landed on a periodical recently called Constellations, an international journal of critical and democratic theory, kind of geeky. And it discussed that having a causal public people influence in debate on lawmaking and policy is not demanding enough for the ideal of democracy. Being challenged by discussion and debate makes you better. And that's the thinking behind my desire as a NOAA member to exercise my public participation easily. So I look forward to the future revisions to the public participation policy with the hope that they increase the voices in the room. Thank you for the work you do for our students and our teachers. Thank you. Um. Hi, my name is Mary Jo Cram. I'm a teacher at the Academy at Old Cockrell. I serve as the secretary treasurer of MNEA and PACE committee chair. I have two children at Dan Mills Elementary School. I stand in opposition to the proposed board policy change concerning public participation as was written in the agenda today. Um, teachers need the opportunity to talk to the school board members who set the policies that govern our working lives. For example, we need to tell you how important our planning time is for our health and sanity and how it affects us when we lose that time to, to meetings, subbing, and other administrative demands. Teachers need a chance to inform the school board about the excessive redundant paperwork we're, we're, we are required to do. And simply speaking with board members privately or by email is not enough. We need to register our support or disagreement with district policies and practices in public because that is how democracy works. We need to make sure everybody knows what is going on in our schools, and speaking here at the school board is an important way for us to do that. Simply allowing 10 minutes or 10 teachers to speak for a total of 30 minutes during a board meeting is not enough. MNEA is a union, and that means our power comes from our numbers. Here at the school board meeting, we have we can show up in mass and present speaker after speaker, all talking about the importance of planning time, for example. And through our sheer number, we can demonstrate that this is not just an issue in one school, but it's widely felt throughout the whole district. When you limit the number of speakers we can put forward in a public forum, you stifle our voice. 
To end on a positive note, I'd like to tell you about MNEA's recent town hall with Mayor Freddie O'Connell. Instead of us asking him questions, he asked us what we would like him to, to know about the school system and how he can support us. He showed us that he understands that leadership requires listening. I hope the school, bo school board will learn from Mayor O'Connor's example. Please su fully support MNPS by protecting planning time and public participation. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's just to number eight. All right, here we go. Good evening, Dr. Adrian Battle, Chair Elrod, and members of the board. I hope you all had an incredible spring break and are looking forward to a successful fourth quarter. I, Sophia Payne, a senior at Hillsborough High School and one of the leaders of Sunrise Hillsborough, had a remarkable week off and am eager to finish these last seven weeks strong by collaborating with you all on a promising Earth Day resolution. Today, I wanted to begin my three minutes of public comment by discussing my previous experience with giving public comment. A bit ironic, isn't it? In the past, I have skimmed through the upcoming meeting agenda for contracts that are semi-related to the environmental topics I would like to speak on. Then, I have tried searching for each contract in the Metro Clerk contract search portal. Later, I usually investigate any contracts that I need more information on before registering to speak through the online form on whichever contract is the most relevant. This time, I wanted to speak on the importance of assisting students in when climate disasters strike in the context of the impacts of anthropogenic climate change that we are already seeing and the inequalities in who those impacts most affect. Anthropogenic climate change is a very real issue and is a major concern for many MNPS students. Globally, the mean temperature has increased and the last 10 years have been the hottest on record. In Nashville alone, there have been more prolonged drought periods and more powerful storms as well. Overall though, anthropogenic climate change is and will continue to shift biomes, agriculture, number and diversity of species, ecological services, ocean pH, sea levels, and human health. Yet, the school board policy states that individuals wishing to address the board must register for an item already on the agenda. I have tried my best to relate my speeches to agenda matters. However, it can be quite difficult to do so. To demonstrate, I have noticed that it is hard to find information about said contracts through the Metro Clerk contract search portal, Google, and the agenda itself. I recently realized the, the Metro Clerk contract search portal only includes contracts that have already been passed. Considering these challenges for student constituents like myself, might I suggest the MNPS school board open public comment for students and parents to speak freely regarding their concerns, or possibly adding more detail to contact, contract descriptions on the meeting agenda that is comparable to what school board members receive, or adding contracts under consideration to the Metro Clerk contract search portal? Only then will students be able to share their concerns in a more equitable manner that does not bar individuals that do not have the same research background I have thanks to my roots at the SSMB. I appreciate your support on our initiatives and I'm grateful for everything you do to keep our school district running smoothly. Thank you, Sophia Rose. All right. Okay. She also has a double name. As somebody that also has a double name that's never recognized, thank you, Sophia Rose. All right. So, um, that gets us to our govern. That gets us uh, to the end of public participation. Thank you so much, and for um, sitting with us during the mic issues. Thank you all for fixing them. That was pretty quick resolution. I appreciate that. And we will get to the alarming fire alarm sound that comes from there. Um, but that also gets us to in our agenda, excuse me, to our governance issues. So we adopted the agenda as not as listed with the amendment of removing um, 1D 1.404, which is the public participation policy so that we can discuss it at a, the next meeting. So we adopted at the beginning of the meeting the agenda with that uh, amendment to it. Is there any objection to us adopting that agenda or adopting this agenda as amended? All right. If there is no agenda, if there is no objection, these items will be adopted. All right. 
That gets us on to board reports. To start us off on board reports, I'm going to move to um, Vice Chair Player so that she can talk to us about her 3.30, um, her 3.30 budget meeting. Uh, we had a budget meeting at 3.30, um, and we gave the initial presentation of our budget. Um, this will be a first in a series of budget meetings um, to discuss and to present and eventually vote on um, our budget that we present to Mayor O'Connell um, so he can file by a timely matter so he can file by May 1st, uh, which would then be presented to the council um, for consideration. So I would like to also um, let everyone know that we will have a community uh, budget meeting on April 1st at 530 at the Martin Professional Center. April 1st, 530 at the Martin uh, Professional Center. So please come out and learn more about our budget. Thank you. Thank you. That gets us to our 415-ish committee that we had for governance. And for that, I'll give um, Chair of Governance, Emily Masters, the floor. Thank you. We had a governance committee meeting and we passed some sort of some cleanup policies. Um, we passed a new um, conflict of interest policy. And I think um, board member Gentry, if you wanted, I know you mentioned maybe wanting to add a little bit more to that. So if we want to talk, talk about getting that together for April 9th meeting, we could do that. Could just keep on going with it. We'll she's, follow up with you like, with your face. Yeah. Um, yeah, conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, so, yeah, yeah. I think it's a new policy. It's not expanding that one, but a new policy that talks about, the, 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 well, no, it's looking at the policy about our board members' engagement in schools. That's it. And how we conduct ourselves. If you would send that to Dr. Sevier. I will send that and to Dr. Sevier. And me, we'll get it cranking. Thank you. And we're just going to knock out all kinds of stuff on April 9th. And yeah, and that's that's the, the moral of the story of the Governance Committee meeting today is that we're going to um, reconvene on April 9th to finish up um, the public participation policy changes. And I'm so, everybody's gone, but appreciative of everybody that was here to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sophia. Thank you. <laughs> so. You know. All right. And then that gets us to Dr. Namal McKinney, who's going to talk to us about Council of Great City Schools. I think it's on. Is it on? Yes. Um, so Dr. Battle, Dr. Renita Perry, is she Dr. E? Yes. She's ABD. Um, and uh, David Brom were all able to, and I were able to attend the Council of Greater City Schools um, Legal and Legislative Policy Conference that was in Washington, D.C. last week. Last week. Um, and so great presentation. Dr. Battle um, and Ms. Perry both presented at the conference um, and talked about the great work that they were doing around pandemic recovery. It was well received within the uh, uh, across the Council of Great City Schools. We were able to also meet um, and, and connect with board members who have also participated in the AON workshops here in Nashville and who are now starting those academies within their communities. Um, we also got to hear a little bit about the work um, that the Assistant Secretary of Education was doing and Dr. Battle um, got to meet with him and it was funny to kind of to witness that experience because Dr. Battle went up and said, hey, I'm Adrian Battle. And he was like, oh, I get to meet you in person. So it was like a fanboying um, of him as well to kind of see like the national lens that MNPS has and the great work that we are doing and leading across the nation. Um, so it's always re, um, uh, uh, affirmation of us doing, moving in the right, right direction and doing the right things. Um, there was a lot of talk about um, school districts um, and state legislation and what they're facing around um, vouchers and how several uh, states and school districts have already experienced it and experienced the devastation within their um, own uh, communities um, and, um, and just gave a lens to kind of what we're looking to experience if this goes through some of the things that we need to think about as a school board um, and as an administration as we continue to move forward. Um, but I, I, I will say, what was the other, that was the major thing was vouchers. That could have went on and on and on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so pandemic recovery, the fiscal cliff that, that some districts will have to, to deal with. Um, but 
those were kind of the main major topics that were discussed um, throughout that legislative conference. Um, and so we walked away with some great things. We also walked away with some bleak things that, that we've seen other communities having to deal with. Um, but I think it's a st I think um, it, it confirms that we're moving in the right direction. We have our foot on the pulse um, and we're thinking about um, all the things that can potentially happen as we're experiencing this moving forward. We're on the right track. Thank you. Okay. That gets us to announcements for this evening. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different with announcements, considering, again, it's the one-year um, anniversary upcoming tomorrow of the covenant tragedy and shooting. Gun violence um, has a particular effect on our children and students. And uh, they deal with, of course, not just those data points, but the actual real life repercussions of gun violence. Not just, of course, our students, but students across the country. Uh, yet they're not often given a platform to share their voice on that. But this is the generation that's dealing with the gun violence. Columbine happened when I was in high school. These are the students that are actually dealing with what has to be done in the, in the fallout or what doesn't have to be done. So. Though our platform may be somewhat small as an announcement situation, I still wanted to turn it over to our two school board members so that they could have this time um, to share any of their opinions on that and turn it over to them. So I will first turn it over to our junior board member and then senior board member. I think we as students are very desensitized to shootings. We hear about it every day on the news. We hear, well, we have shoot, well, shooting drills and it's difficult to you know like, well, well, it's probably not going to happen to us, but it does, and that's such a sad, sad reality. But and most we could do now is just hope for the best and hope something's done about, you know, gun control. Senior board member, I wrote a little something, um, but I just said uh, that as we approach the one-year anniversary of the COVID shooting, I encourage everyone to reflect. Firstly, on the precious lives that we lost on March 27, 2023, and second, what you have done in the year that has followed to ensure that you are supporting our Nashville students. Whether that be through attending protests, advocacy at the state legislature, or the simplest yet arguably most powerful act of voting, I encourage every citizen to remember the day that shook our community and continue to work together in order to create a supportive, loving, and safe future for our young people. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, our meeting is adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.